In August 1999, best friends Rafi Kodikian and David Coughlin set out from Boston, Massachusetts on a road trip to tour the western part of the United States. They stop at Carlsbad Caverns National Park in southern New Mexico, which is situated in the Chihuahua Desert. They plan to camp overnight and continue the road trip in the morning. Instead, four days later, park ranger Mark Masia would get a call that an urgent rescue was underway in Rattlesnake Canyon which was a little-used corner of Carlsbad Caverns National Park. He got this call to extract the two young men. He was told it was an urgent situation, but unfortunately for David, it was too late, and he would never leave the National Park again. Real quick, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video, Hunt Killer, for helping the channel stay afloat. Hunt a Killer is a murder mystery game that is as immersive as it is fun. Whether it's you and your significant other or just a group of friends, it can turn any boring night into a puzzle-solving adventure. Grab a bottle of wine and sift through the piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files. You'll identify murder weapons, eliminate suspects, and use your logical problem-solving talents to figure out who the killer is. I've been playing our first month with my girlfriend and I'm mind blown at the detail that goes into these cases. This is a story, and you can tell they took their time putting the story together. If you're watching this channel and you listen to True Crime Podcast, I'm willing to bet you have the kind of mind for solving cases. Hunt a Killer has over 100,000 active subscribers with over 2,000 five-star reviews. Also, a part of the proceeds for every single box you purchase goes towards the Cold Case Foundation, which is dedicated to helping real-life cold cases. Honestly, before I even heard of Hunt a Killer, it was something that I wish had existed. Go to huntakiller.com forward slash strangeland and use the code word strangeland for 20% off your first box. Again, type in the code word strangeland for 20% off your first box. Get into your first case and see if you can solve the mystery. It's a lot of fun. Some of the proceeds go to a good foundation. And because a lot of our episodes are demonetized, they're really helping the channel. So thank you, Hunter Killer, and thank you for listening to this episode for your support. Now let's get back to the episode. Rafi Kodikian and David Coughlin met in college and became best friends. They were introduced by Kirsten Swan, who became Rafi's girlfriend and eventual housemate. In court, Rafi described David as, quote, the closest thing I had to a brother. All three became close, inseparable. They took trips together to the beach, spent nights shooting pool, and took weekend trips to Philadelphia, which I can only imagine to get up to no good. There's, there's nothing to do there but that. Uh, the relationship between David and Rafi grew closer over time, even after Rafi and Kirsten broke up. By 1999, both men were in their mid-twenties and they were starting their professional careers. Rafi worked a 9-to-5 behind a desk at an insurance company as he moonlighted as a writer. Writing and journalism were his real professional ambitions. He had a few articles on travel-related topics published by the Boston Globe. David worked as a clerk at the town hall in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where he grew up. His easygoing nature and genuine friendliness made him excel at dealing with the public and responding to complaints. But he too had bigger career ambitions. He was accepted into graduate school in California and was planning his move out west. As they so often did, they decided to make a trip to move David's belongings to the west coast together. One more road trip before the friends were separated across the continent. So by the last week in July, they had David's red Mazda loaded with his belongings, some camping gear, and a blank journal in which both men would record their experiences during the trip, and they hit the road, traveling south from Boston. So Rafi and David set out on their journey west. They left on Friday, July 30th, taking five days to reach Carlsbad Canyon National Park the following Wednesday. When Rafi and David arrived at the park, they checked in at the ranger station, where they filled out a permit allowing them to camp overnight on park property. They listed the dates they planned to camp, and most importantly, the date they expected to return. They were also given a crash course on the area and the recommended supplies and precautions that they would need to take on a trip into the backcountry desert in mid-August. This included a recommendation of one gallon of water per person per day at a minimum. The park rules were explained. No fires. Pack out what you pack in. Don't disturb any plants or animals. And buy a topographical map. These same rules you'll see posted at any national park in America. Rafi and David then went to the park's visiting center that had a small gift shop and purchased three one-pint bottles of water, two regular-sized bottles of Gatorade, and a topographical map, which neither one of them knew how to read. Why didn't they buy more water to take with them? 
why purchase only three pints of water when the recommended minimum was four times as much? Raffi later explained that they thought the three bottles would be enough for the amount of time they planned to spend there. They were arriving in the late afternoon and did not plan to explore the park for any length of time. They planned to get back on the road again early the next day and would be back in civilization where water and supplies could be found virtually anywhere. It was around 6 p.m. by the time they left the store and headed to the place they planned to pitch their tent for the night. They parked their car at the trailhead leading to Rattlesnake Canyon. It is important to note that the trailhead where they parked was less than one mile from the ranger station. The area is desert, meaning the ground is primarily sand. And there are a few plants or landmarks, so rangers mark the trail every 50 yards or so with rock cairns, 15-inch high piles of white limestone rock. Raffi and David considered themselves well-equipped, and indeed they had some of the core items considered necessities when heading out into the desert to spend any length of time, such as pocket knives, hats, sunglasses, boots, flashlights, matches, and band-aids. But there were many key items that they didn't have. A compass, signal mirror, binoculars, a whistle, and a first aid kit. They toted some basic camping gear into the canyon for their overnight stay and brought a two-man nylon tent, sleeping bags, foam pads, and a propane stove to cook on. To eat, they packed a can of cream corn and a large can of baked beans. They also had half a bag of hot dogs, some buns, and a few energy bars. Raffi and David hiked the trail for about 20 minutes down to the canyon floor, where they chugged water from the pint bottles that each carried, with the third bottle packed away with their gear. It was early August and the temperatures hovered in the high 80s, even after 6 o'clock in the evening. Reaching the bottom of the canyon, they had a choice to make. There were only two directions they could go, up the canyon, following a trail to their right, or down it to the left. The map indicated that the trail to the left was the main trail, while the one to the right was marked as a, quote, primitive route. They went the primitive route and turned right, heading up. After about a mile, they left the trail and hiked another quarter mile up the side of the canyon to the west. Here they found an area of flat ground free of succulents and their spikes, and this is where they pitched their camp. The two friends had an uneventful night. They had dinner and they went to bed. They woke up at about 8 a.m. the following morning and quickly packed up their gear and trash and headed toward the car, which would carry them to the Grand Canyon later that day, and at least that was their plan. After a mile walking, they came to a cairn at the edge of a dry riverbed. Next to it was a path leading into a small brush field that seemed to head down toward the canyon's eastern slope, which they remembered from their hike in. They stopped to get their bearings and finished the last of their bottled water to fortify them for the quick hike to the car. After walking another 50 yards, they both started to get a little worried. None of their surroundings seemed familiar to them. They changed direction, uh, reasoning that the trail out of the canyon must be at the back of the brush field they passed. So they turned around and walked back the way they had just come, this time searching hard for the rock cairn trail marker. Raffi and Dave decided to cut through the small field, and if they did not recognize anything, they would go even further back down the trail reasoning that it was probably no more than a few hundred yards. They believed their logic was sound. After reversing, they saw something reassuring. Several white cairns laying in a flat area of the dry riverbed. They were searching for the junction of the two trails and the markers. To their untrained eyes, it seemed to suggest that the trail exit was nearby. They knew their car was to the east, and they headed off in that general direction, using the sun as a compass. Expecting to find more of the cairns that dotted the trail at regular intervals, but they were mystified to find none. So as they were looking at the map, they located the road and the trailhead where the car was parked. They also followed the dotted line of the trail down into the canyon. But as they glanced from the swirl of lines on the map to the real-life 3D world in front of them, uh, looking for points of reference... They couldn't really gain a good scope on where they were. Being in the canyon already, they weren't able to get a good perspective and they felt they needed to make a better sense of the map. In fact, they thought the map might be confusing them needlessly, so they stowed it in with the rest of their gear in favor of doing a more careful grid search along the riverbed. And it seems like it never works out wherever you 
when you put the map away. But Yeah, they're abandoning the map. They kept expecting the magic trail marking Karen to appear at each bend in the trail, and each time their expectations were subverted. They weren't worried at this point yet. The trail had to be nearby because they hiked down to it the night before. It couldn't be too far away because if they backtracked much further, they'd be at the campsite they just left. By 11 a.m., the sun had risen above the canyon walls and the temperature was creeping into the low 90s. They set down their heavy packs and rested under what little shade was cast by the short, scrubby bushes. And this is when they started to get worried. Not having any backcountry experience, the two boys simply didn't have any solutions to this problem. They didn't know where to begin. This was 1999, and neither owned a cell phone, and they had no way of calling or even signaling for help. In fact, they hadn't come upon another soul since they'd left the visitor center near the park office. So they simply sat where they were, not sure of what to do. Perhaps they were trying to come to terms with the seriousness of their predicament. At noon, a cloud cover rolled into the sky above the canyon, bringing a brief rain shower. They managed to drink some of the water pulling around the base of bigger rocks, and then collected more in their mouths to spit into their empty water bottles, managing to gather about three-fourths of a pint each, which they would then ration. Feeling somewhat revived by the rain, Raffi and David knew the trail was nearby, they didn't know if they had gone too far and overshot it or whether they had not yet gone far enough. But they didn't want to make the situation worse by getting lost, which they already were technically, by uh, wandering around aimlessly. So they decided to stay put and wait for a park ranger to come find them. One ranger who was later interviewed about the tragedy would say, quote, It's not like you file a flight plan and we come looking if you fail to show up on time. In fact, rangers would not go searching for Raffi and David for another four days after a park volunteer happened to notice that David's red Mazda hadn't moved from the lot and reported it to park staff. Unfortunately, Raffi and David bet their survival on being rescued by park rangers. Perhaps this was the only scenario that they could fathom, given their lack of experience in backcountry landscapes. They simply couldn't think of anything else to do to solve their problem. In their minds, the permit they filled out at the park office was a receipt that entitled them to rescue, like a type of contract. Raffi would later say that they were worried the ranger had misplaced their permit, uh, lost it, or actually misfiled it. Hunger was also beginning to be a problem. David noticed clumps of prickly pear cactus, whose fruit turned out to be sweet and full of water, so they ate their fill and cut more for later. They walked up a nearby hill to search for the trail, but returned to their makeshift campsite when they failed to find it, and they spent their second night in Rattlesnake Canyon. Why they were eating cactus fruit or any wild food unfamiliar to them when they still had a large can of beans, if not the energy bars, is unknown. The unopened can of beans would be found among their gear when investigators obtained a search warrant to examine the camp for evidence. During the night, they believed they spotted headlights in the distance. Immediately in front of their camp were three successive slopes on the canyon wall. They thought they saw headlights on the farthest slope, so in the morning they began walking in that direction, hoping to come across a road. They left a note for the rangers in case they should come while they were gone. It read, quote, Help, help. We filled out a backcountry card on Wednesday afternoon and headed down. Camped Wednesday and started back on Thursday morning, but couldn't find the entrance to the trail leading to the car. Looked all day Thursday, slept here Thursday night, and saw headlights along mountain number three around midnight. We're headed for that peak. We've got minimal water and have been eating cactus fruit. We need help. We headed towards what appeared to be the ranch foundation to begin. If and when we reach the car, we will go to the visitor center to attempt to come back for gear carefully. End quote. Raffi and David climbed the first slope and went down into the valley that was covered with creosote bushes and large networks of cacti. They kept having to veer around the plants and then get back on course, climbing in short bursts. Each time they stopped to rest, they would suck on some of the cactus fruit that they had cut earlier. They continued their hike until they reached the third slope summit and immediately saw that there was no road. Raffi still is not sure what caught their attention that they believed to be headlights. But there was no road, and now they knew they were even farther away from their car than they were in the morning. The situation was getting worse, not better. 
The only advantage they had now was perspective. They were no longer in the canyon, surrounded on all sides by high sloping canyon walls. At their elevation, they could see for miles around. Yet despite this, they failed to notice many landmarks that would have told them their location of the car. The plateau they were standing on was the same that the visitor center stood on. Although the visitor center was about 6 miles away and a good 500 feet lower in altitude, it should have been clearly visible. Also in the view from where they stood were the canyon's elevator tower and several 20 foot high water tanks. Raffi claims they didn't see any of it. What David did notice was Rattlesnake Springs, an oasis river that runs through the Chihuahua Desert that was about 4 miles away. If he had looked closer, he would have seen several buildings belonging to the park which housed a camp for children with disabilities. Maybe the cottonwood trees blocked a clear view, but David did believe that they would find a road along the route to the springs. Rafi did not want to move. He was dispirited from not finding the road and physically exhausted from their hike during the high heat of the day. He told David to go if he thought he could make it and to send help back for him. But David ultimately decided that they shouldn't split up and that he didn't want to wander out into the desolate landscape alone. The two men decided to head back to camp, which they knew was near their car instead of going toward the river. The, you know, the river had water, but no guarantees of anything else. They would just be lost with water. Roughly halfway back to camp, their thirst became overpowering, and they decided to try drinking their own urine. Rafi strained his urine through his baseball cap, but gagged as soon as it touched his lips. David didn't even want to try, so they abandoned the idea. They continued their long, hot walk back to camp, which, by the way, I don't, I mean, I think they're just lost. I don't even know if they really know how to get, to get back to that camp anyways. As they progressed, David's legs became increasingly weaker and wobbly. Rafi had to physically support him most of the way back. Rafi said that David seemed to be experiencing the physical effects of their ordeal more intensely than himself. They were beginning their third night in the desert outback, with no food and no water, and more importantly, no way out of their dilemma that they could see. They were enraged and credulous that the park rangers had not arrived to rescue them. They finally came to accept that no one would be coming to save them and they would have to find their way out. They made a new plan to rest that evening, then get out in the morning. If David was unable to walk, Rafi would go by himself and bring back help. But in the morning, David found he had enough strength left for another try to make it back to the car. They left their gear, and both were now suffering greatly from dehydration. David and Rafi set out again to find the trail leading out of the canyon and back to their car in the trailhead lot. And they were hiking under the full blaze of the midsummer desert sun in the middle of the day with no liquid of any kind. They located a rock cairn that they believe marked at the trail's end at the floor of the canyon, but couldn't find the second cairn, no matter how hard they tried. Finally exhausted and defeated, David announced that he was returning to the camp that they had stayed the night before. He was giving up. Didn't feel like he could go on, and why bother anyway? Rafi said he would keep searching. After a few minutes, Rafi heard David calling for him from the camp. He returned and David told him that he was afraid Rafi would get hurt or lost. David had begun arranging the largest stones that he could find on the canyon floor, spelling out SOS. David was swaying on his feet as he struggled to move the rocks. Rafi took over the chore of moving the rocks and told David to work on a signal fire. Find anything in their gear he thought would burn enough to be spotted from a distance. He threw the items in a pile, doused it with the last of their camp stove fuel oil, and lit it on fire. They were immediately disappointed in the size of the smoke as it quickly dissipated. So they didn't pull a Tom Hanks and cast away. Yeah, it didn't work. Later that afternoon, David penned a note in the journal to his girlfriend. It read, quote, Sonnet. Baby, I'm writing this with a shaking hand. That was not intentional, I swear. I do not know what to do right now, but I am in utter agony, and know you would understand. I love you so much. I have barely eaten and drank since Wednesday evening. Nobody is coming to help. I love you. Tell Dan, if I find a heavenly monkey, I will forward one along. We had forever, but now all we have is eternity. Who knows? Maybe I'll get kicked out for disorderly conduct, and I'll be able to pay you a visit. You will always be in my heart, 
and you will always have an angel by your side. Eternally yours, David Andrew. P.S. I am trying so hard to be strong right now. It's not working. End quote. So yeah, that was the letter that he wrote. And you can really tell that he is preparing to die. I mean, he th- obviously, I mean, he wrote this letter with the intentions that, you know, he is going to die. The temperature in the canyon that day reached 110 degrees. They cut out the bottom of their tent to allow what breeze there was to reach them as they lay in the shade. They weren't capable of much more, except at one point, they reached down to grab handfuls of small pebbles and released them over their backs to mimic the sensation of rain. David wrote another note, addressing family and close friends. When finished, he asked Rafi to read it for him because he couldn't tell if it made sense. The neurological effects of dehydration were worsening. Rafi became alarmed. He too wrote notes to be read by his family and friends after they found his body. David was in serious pain. Rafi recounted later that they decided to end their lives together. They both took out their pocket knives and a few superficial scratches would later be found on both of their arms, but neither was successful in ending his life. Rafi states that sometime near dawn, David made a request that Rafi would honor, as he could no longer stand the pain he was in. Rafi wrote in his journal, I killed and buried my best friend today. David had been in pain all night. At around five or six, he turned to me and begged that I put my knife through his chest. I did, and a second time when he wouldn't die. He still breathed and spoke, so I told him I was going to cover his face. He said okay. He struggled, but died. I buried him with love. God and his family and mine, please forgive me. Rafi Kodikian In just a few hours, the park volunteer would spot David's car and would summon rangers to check on the two campers, whose checkout they realized was three days overdue. Instead, rangers found David's lifeless body under a cairn of stones that Raffi had arranged in a cowboy grave for his best friend, just a few feet away from the tent, where Raffi would be found by rangers. For a situation that could be adequately summarized in one sentence, the events surrounding the death of David Coughlin would evoke much controversy and debate. I mean, they were one mile away from the ranger station. Investigators interviewed after these events all marveled at how close the campsite was to the trail leading out. Looking from atop one of the many ledges along the trail overlooking the canyon, they marvel, how could they have missed it? What's more is it's rare for people to get lost at all in Carlsbad Caverns National Park. It is the sixth smallest national park with only 47,000 acres. In its 69-year history as of 1999, not a single person has ever disappeared there. Other questions nag to be answered, like why did they give up so easily and so early on into their ordeal? Why didn't they do more to get themselves out of their predicament? When Rafi claims David's physical decline was worse and more rapid than his own, it remains a fact that Rafi's condition was not critical, and he was in relatively good condition. He was released from the hospital within an hour. So it's just kind of weird that David was on the brink of death, and Rafi was released very quickly from the hospital. And if you think about it, it really comes down to whether Rafi acted out of malice or mercy. It is impossible to know with any certainty what lies inside another's heart and mind. We cannot know with any certainty what drives another person, the true emotion driving them to act. So we do the next best thing. We look at the evidence. Is there any evidence in this case that Rafi acted out of malice? Law enforcement and investigators for the district attorney looked long and hard for any evidence of this and came up empty. They really couldn't find a benefit that Rafi would accrue for killing his best friend. Critics have raised a few possibilities that Rafi killed David because he believed there was a budding romantic interest between David and Rafi's girlfriend, Kirsten Swan. But a closer look reveals that this is more of a mere supposition without any substance to support it. Even David's family doesn't credit the theory that Rafi killed David to eliminate him as a romantic rival. In fact, they can think of no reason, no malice on Rafi's part that would drive him to kill David without justification. Quote, We can think of no reason why Rafi would have wished David any harm or pain, unquote, the statement said. 
Quote, moreover, we cannot presume to know what transpired or the thoughts and emotions the two experienced during the days before David's death. To be sure, we have questions. However, we find it difficult to believe there was any malicious intent. Unquote. Rafi has spoken publicly only twice about the events that day. Once when he testified in court at a sentencing hearing, and again during a single interview he gave to the show 2020. That's it. That's the sum total of Rafi going public with his story. In fact, his mother has become his de facto spokesperson, who speaks on his behalf when necessary. What is justice in this case? A New Mexico judge sentenced Rafi Kadikian to 15 years in prison for his actions, but then immediately suspended 13 years, meaning Rafi would only spend 24 months in prison and be subject to five years probation upon his release. The sentence was a result of a plea agreement reached between Rafi and the New Mexico officials, in which he would plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for the suspended sentence. Despite the sentencing hearing marking the official end of the case, the controversy rages on. Interviews with the participants in this case following the trial summarize the polarizing positions. Quote, I don't care what anyone says. People just don't do that to their friends. Eddy County Sheriff Mark Anthony Click said. The county prosecutor was similarly unimpressed. Quote, you don't get to kill someone in the state of New Mexico just because they ask you to. End quote. Kodikian said after the hearing, quote, I feel that anyone in my position who would turn their back on their friend wouldn't have been deserving of coming out of that canyon. End quote. So what do you think about Rafi Kodikian's actions? Was he right? Was he wrong? Was this a mercy killing? Or was there some other intention uh, behind this? Let us know in the comments. This is so weird, man. Like, I, I don't know. It, I think it, one point you can make is to say, yeah, it's really easy for us to talk and be like, yeah, we would never do that when, we're, when the truth is we're not in that situation. You yeah. know what I mean? But also, it's like... They could have been more... I would have been like, bruh, drink this bean juice and I'm not going to stab you in your chest. It just seems like a better way. Yeah. And if if Rafi had some other intentions, you know, he could have faked all of the letters and notes and everything and killed him and got and basically got away with it. But we... I don't know if we know. Um, I kind of have a feeling what everyone... what, What most people in the comment section will think. But we'll see. So welcome Stefan back and we will see you next week. Later, guys.